Now, there's a number of cells that are associated with lymph, um, and they tend to be white blood cells. So uh, there's a fine line between the lymphatic cells and blood cells, uh, formed elements from the blood, but nevertheless. So lymphocytes, obviously, are found primarily in the lymph. Now, lymphocytes, T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes, are a type of white blood cell. They're made in the bone marrow. They, they move through the body in blood, but they usually act in, in lymph tissue. We're going to talk a little bit about lymphatic tissue in a, in a couple of minutes. So they are part of the immune system. They, um, they protect against antigens. They're specific uh, immunity. And, and when we do immunity uh, after the break, we will, we will talk about that. But they basically uh, attack things that are foreign, bacteria, viruses, fungi, um, blood cells, uh, cancer cells, anything that's not right. They, they help take care of. Uh, we'll talk about them at, in great detail later in the course. There's also macrophages happen in here. They phagocytize, they clean up. Um, they're, they're involved with immune activation. Uh, they, about, they clean up debris. Uh, and so obviously then having them, especially in the lymph nodes, is a, is a good thing. There's other types of um, cells. There's the dendritic cells that, uh, that are involved with capturing antigens and reticular cells that, that are basically cells that help make the space, the lymphoid tissue and uh, the space that's in, in the lymphoid organs and, and tissue. So uh, when we look at, at lymphoid tissue, and these aren't the, the collecting vessels. These are tissues that are found throughout the body where the immune system operates. We need a lot of space for interstitial fluid and a lot of space for things to, uh, to work. Um, and so it is really a net-like tissue with a lot of space. Net and ret are the same word, so reticular cells are, uh, and reticular fibers in uh, reticular um, tissue, reticular connective tissue, which is a type of loose connective tissue, is where all of this happens. In the space, uh, they're called, it's called this, the sinuses, and this is where the lymphocytes and the macrophages and such, generally speaking, work. So where do we find lymphoid tissue? We find it all over the place. Uh, we, we find it uh, either diffusely mixed in with all the other connective tissues of the body, and we call this diffuse lymphatic tissue, or we find it in discrete little patches and areas um, in places where... Um, where we need surveillance, and we call these lymphatic follicles. Um, lymphatic follicle is a much better word than the old word, which was lymph nodules, uh, because lymph nodules sound too much like lymph nodes, but um, the lymphatic follicles or nodules are just discrete little packages of this reticular connective tissue that provide the place for the lymphocytes to work. Right. So the diffuse is just about everywhere. Uh, we have more of it where at the borders where things can get in. So along the, the mucous membranes, and we have it in the lymphoid organs. We'll, and I'll be talking about the organs of the lymphatic system momentarily. But those organs are made up primarily of this lymphoid type tissue. So, uh, so these follicles are 
spherical bodies of reticular tissue. Uh, now, they're not considered organs because they don't have more than one tissue type. There's only the reticular tissue. So, um, they're, they're not considered organs, but, but you can see them, uh, especially under the microscope. Now, lymph nodes are, in fact, organs. There is lymphoid tissue surrounded by a capsule of dense, irregular connective tissue. Um, and we find these scattered along the, the collecting vessels of the lymph. It's where the, the lymph collecting vessels join. Now, we get them... Uh, I'd like to tell to say that we find them where places bend. Uh, so we get them kind of in your crotch area where the where your hip joint is. We get a little bit behind the knee. We get them uh, kind of at the elbow. We get them in the armpit, the shoulder, uh, kind of in the pec region, along your neck and face so kind of along your like near your jaw and that kind of thing um, and they all have these clusters all tend to have names so the ones that are found in the inguinal region are called the inguinal nodes so that's right along the inguinal ligament and it's kind of at the root of of your lower limb uh, the ones in the armpit are the axillary nodes the ones in uh, in around the shoulder or the subclavian nodes, uh, you know, the cervical nodes are in the neck. There's a cervical chain of nodes, etc. They're all, all there. So lymph nodes really is the place where the lymph gets cleaned. So uh, it gets cleaned of debris and it gets cleaned of pathogens. So the debris gets filtered and the macrophages uh, basically just eat up anything that's there, anything organic that, that's there, proteins and, and microorganisms, cellular debris, um, the remains of burst cells, etc., all end up in the lymph node and the macrophages that, are, that live in the lymph node just phagocytize it, they eat it. And this is also the place where the lymphocytes meet the antigens and start your uh, immune response. So the, I think that uh, when we talk immunity, one of the things that you have to be careful of is that the, the lymphocytes don't kind of cruise around the body looking for bad guys. The bad guys kind of get sucked in and brought before the lymphocytes. So the lymph nodes, they look like a bean. Uh, they have this fibrous capsule, and they've got these walls inside called trabeculae. Uh, and they're divided into a cortex and a medulla, the, in, and kind of a center and an outside. Um, in the cortex, we have lots of follicles, where we've got uh, lots of of um, reticular tissue, and this is where the the B lymphocytes are, etc. Uh, there's T lymphocytes found in there, right? And uh, and it looks like this. Now, looks like a bean. Anything that's bean shaped. The indent on this side is called the hilum or the hilus. Uh, we have lymphatic vessels coming into it that are called afferent vessels. Afferent means coming towards. And we have vessels leaving. They're called efferent vessels. You'll notice that there's far more afferent vessels than efferent vessels. If you had one, two, three, four, five, five lanes of traffic reduced to two lanes, what would happen to traffic? It would slow down. By having five inputs and only two outgoing vessels, the lymph slows down in here, 
gives time for the filtering and the macrophages and the lymphocytes and all of that stuff to happen. Now you'll notice that the capsule, which is a dense regular their dense irregular connective tissue all around the outside has extensions that come in and they basically form walls inside and those are called trabeculae. Now the trabeculae really are about increasing surface area so that lymph that comes in here has to flow along here and then along here and then kind of along here and maybe that way to get out or you know maybe keep on going it 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 kind of creates a pathway that that's extended right because as the lymph is flowing through these areas that's when it comes in contact with the macrophages and the lymphocytes so we want as much of that as possible so so in the middle, there's the medulla, uh, and we're not going to worry too much about it, but this is where the B cells, T cells, plasma cells, which are B cells that are activated are called plasma cells, uh, are normally found. This is also where the macrophages are. There's sinuses, there's spaces in the, in the medulla that the macrophages can chase down the prey and eat it. Photograph of, of exactly what it looks like. So the lymph goes into the lymph node through the afferent vessels and it passes through through uh, through sinuses and then exits at the hillis. Um, so it's subcapular, capsular, not subscapular. Uh, it's so just below the the capsule that space that I indicated is where it, it ends up flowing um, you want the the lymph flow to slow down in the the nodes because you need time to, to function so again same pictures now when a lymph node gets swollen uh, it can get really inflamed because there's sometimes great battles raging in here and they can become palpable they they enlarge and they and they become palpable and they can actually block the flow of lymph so uh, because they're so inflamed and in that case you end up with edema distal to the to the nodes um, it's common in a lot of diseases. Now, what we, the correct name for uh, an inflamed, tender lymph node is a bobo. Uh, and that's where we get the term, oh, do you have a boo-boo or a bobo? You know, and you say to little kids, because there was a time when a lot of infections, because before antibiotics, a lot of infections caused bobos, uh, inflamed lymph nodes. Now, there was a very important disease, an infection by a bacteria carried uh, by fleas and rats. The vectors were fleas that fed on rats and then bit humans and it would be in the saliva and the bacteria is called Yersinia pestis uh, where we get the word pest from and we also get the word pestilent from meaning causing disease and this this Yersinia pestis would end up in the lymph nodes and they would cause inflamed lymph nodes or bobos so the name of the disease was the bubonic plague because it caused bobos and when people got the bubonic plague, they ended up having peripheral edema really bad. Uh, they would end up with with their faces started to swell up and they would so they they would get big bags under their eyes. Uh, 
they would get pulmonary edema and they so they would cough and sneeze but uh, you know, because the mucous membranes in their noses would, would get inflamed and fill up, so they'd be coughing and sneezing. Now, these people, uh, you know, the, the, the edema would get so bad, their skin would split and they would leak, or every little cut they would have would leak interstitial fluid because there was a lot of edema when you had bubonic plague. And the people normally died of pneumonia. They would, uh, they would pass away from fluid accumulating in their lungs. And at the time, they, well, uh, and you can just imagine that these people didn't have a change of clothes and there's no running water, so they probably smelt pretty bad too. So what they used to do was put uh, flowers and, and sweet smelling herbs and things in their pockets. Uh, they would make, uh, try and hide the stench of themselves. Uh, so they would have pockets with flowers in them and they didn't know what was causing it at the time because it was before they understood bacteria and they didn't know if it was contagious they didn't know how it was transmitted but you wanted your kids to be street proofed against it you didn't want your kids to get the bubonic plague so you put them on the lookout uh, for anybody with ring around the rosies which is their eyes a pocket full of posies flowers in their pockets Achoo, achoo, so people sneezing, and then they fall dead. Uh, so the, the nursery rhyme, Ring Around the Rosy, was really street proofing for bubonic plague, which is all about lymph nodes and Yersinia pestis and bobos. So now the lymph nodes filter and clean the lymph, and they, they deal with, with that very well and there's lots and lots of lymph nodes because lymph flows very slowly but we also have to filter and clean and maintain blood now blood moves very quickly so you don't need a whole bunch of these lymphoid organs to do it you only need one and we call this one the spleen uh, the splenic artery goes into it the splenic vein leaves there's a hilus it looks like a huge big lymph node and this is where immune surveillance happens. It cleans the blood of old cells, debris, platelets. It does basically the same thing the lymph node does for lymph, for blood. But because blood circulates once a minute, we don't really need a lot of them. That's what the spleen ends up looking like. Uh, the, it's about the size of a bar of soap. Really, it just sits right above the, the pancreas. So this is considered a, a lymphoid organ because it's the same reticular connective tissue in a capsule. So it does a bunch of other things. It stores blood platelets. Um, before there are bones and bone marrow, this is where urethrocyte production happens. Uh, it uh, also stores the breakdown products for of red blood cells so it stores iron for us so that we can reuse it later i'm not so worried about the red pulp and white pulp but it's basically areas that that do the different things um looks looks roughly like this arteries and veins and in between are sinuses and and the surveillance happens in the reticular tissue there. Another lymph, lymphatic organ is called the thymus. It's found in the inferior part of the neck and down the mediastinum. In kids, it is relatively huge, but that's mostly because kids are small. Uh, like infants are, are very small, so the thymus is very big. Um, it gets bigger as, as people get bigger, or at least through, through adolescence. Uh, in adults, it's, it stops growing, so it seems, takes on relatively smaller proportions, but then it gradually at, atrophies, it, it goes away. Now the thymus is the place where the immune system 
becomes activated. Um, and so it is reticular tissue and it's got all kinds of lymphocytes because this is where the lymphocytes become immunocompetent, which is a topic for uh, after the break. But it has this same look, the same uh, reticular look. It doesn't fight antigens directly. It's not involved with that surveillance. There are other uh, things. There are tonsils. Now, the tonsils basically are like what do what the lymph nodes in the spleen does, but it does it for air and food passing through the tubes of the digestive system. So there's this lymphatic tissue that surrounds the different kind of openings. So the palatine tonsils are on the palate at the posterior end of, the, of your mouth. The lingual tonsils are at the base of your tongue. Lingual means tongue. Pharyngeal fossa tonsils are in the pharynx, uh, especially in the posterior wall of the nasopharynx, which is really, when they get enlarged, they're called the adenoids. Tubal tonsils surround the eustachian tubes, the auditory openings uh, into the pharynx. Um, now, tonsils act mo more as a um, as quality control. They take samples of whatever passes by and examines them and warns the rest of the body what's coming. So if, if food has got bacteria in it, uh, the tonsils sample that, identify the antigens that are, are there, if any, and then prepares the body prepares the immune system to fight that particular antigen. So basically there's little crypts that trap uh, bacteria and, and etc. And, and help deal with this stuff. But by no means is it complete. Uh, it's more like a, a sampling. Now anything that is picked up by the tonsils is killed. But like I say, it's not complete. This is what gave rise to the idea that tonsils were really not that necessary. Um, I will maintain that you can live without your tonsils, but you live better with them. Not 100% necessary doesn't necessarily mean useless. So that's what the tonsils end up looking like as, as a photograph. And you'll notice it's a lot of reticular connective tissue. There's other patches uh, of, you know, other follicles of lymph. Uh, all along the small intestine, there's clusters of these follicles called Peyer's patches. Um, they basically help deal with any antigens, any invaders that are coming via the digestive system. There's uh, a bunch in the appendix. Uh, and they destroy bacteria. They keep the bad guys in the lumen, which is outside of your body. Uh, and they kill anything that comes in. But they also, again, help warn the body of the impending invasion. So it ends up looking like this. This is cross-section of intestinal wall. And there's all of these patches of lymphoid tissue and you can see that it's quite extensive so that's why they're called Peyer's patches. So this is not uh, not diffuse but rather discrete bundles of the patches of them. So all of this stuff that's that's associated with the mucosa right from the from your mouth to your anus uh, are collectively known as mucosal associated lymphatic tissue, MALT. So this is tonsils, pyrus patches, the appendix, uh, nodules in the, in the respiratory tracts, uh, and all of that together 
are known as malt. Now we will pick up this story uh, when we do um, the immune system and the immune response. Uh, this is basically the structural components of that immune response, how the physiological components of the immune response are subject of another lecture.